time, your lines will again. Good afternoon and welcome to the Tech Data Microsoft Law Program Overview. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. If you should need assistance during the call, please press star, then zero, and an operator will come back online to assist you. Thank you. I would now like to turn the conference over to Kanisha Barnes. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kanisha Barnes, and I am the SPLA Business Development Rep here at Tech Data. Um, I just wanted to start off by thanking everyone for taking the time out of your day to join the SPLA webinar. Um, I would just like to go over a few things before we begin. If you look in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a Q&A um, pod. You'll be able to submit your questions throughout the um, webinar there, and we'll address these questions at the end. Also, after today's webinar, there will be a drawing for a Microsoft Band. If you're selected, we'll be in touch. So now I'm going to turn this over to Lance Bratt, who is our channel executive for hosting at Microsoft. Lance? Thank you, Kanisha. So yes, again, my name is Lance Spratt, and I have been working on the hosting team at Microsoft for almost 10 years now. Um, been in SPLA the whole time, so I would like to explain the SPLA opportunity and give an overview of the program and some of the benefits today. Um, so on the slide in front of you, you see an overview. We Again, we'll talk about the opportunity. We'll talk about what SPLA is some of the various benefits and features will be covered, um, licensing models we'll talk about, we will go over license mobility for software assurance, we'll touch on Azure, and finally, um, program eligibility and requirements. So next slide, please. So when we think about the Microsoft strategy, you really see the three pillars here, uh, one of which is on-premise environments, so that's really the traditional model of buying your own licenses for internal use. Um, those would be used by your internal employees and contractors and so forth. And that's the way things were done for quite a long time, up until about 10 years back, maybe a little longer. Um, in the middle, you see the service provider hosting. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about SPLA. So SPLA stands for the Service Provider License Agreement, and it covers any hosted services you provide your end customers. Um, and then finally on the right, you have Microsoft Public Cloud that would be Azure. So that's a, a public cloud where you have many different partners that are transacting and, and ran by one big provider like Microsoft. Um, so these are the three ways to license, or pardon me, the three different offerings really, I should say. So when we talk about service provider hosting, again, the, the main thing there is that you're providing software as a service. Uh, when you think about software as a service, that really means that you are, uh, the, the people that are transacting with you are purely transacting to use your software. So unlike uh, going on a website and buying a book from, say, Barnes & Noble, where you're just doing a transaction, this would be more like uh, maybe using a tax application like TurboTax to do your taxes. The reason you're there is to use the software. So the people on this phone call, I assume, are hosters providing these types of software services, again, where the access to that software service is the primary benefit. And, uh, and that's, that's why your end customer sign up with you, to use your software. So again, in SPLA, it's all about the software. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, a lot of confusion sometimes comes around e-commerce. So um, SPLA is different. So the common technologies that um, these three different pillars share are identity, virtualization, management, and development. These things are kind of obvious. Um, all, all of those aspects would go into any offering. So moving along to the next slide, please. So when we think about the market opportunity for SPLA and, and hosting, it is huge. Uh, when I started 10 years ago, very small, small program. We have grown substantially. And you know, when I came in here, it was before we even you know, had the word cloud or we really, really used it in these cases. So things have changed a lot. SPLA is going three times faster than traditional licensing. So um, a lot more people are going to experts to provide a service rather than you know, doing it themselves. So in the past, you may have had say, an insurance company that had their own exchange server or hosted their own website. Now they're coming to the experts like you on this phone call and um, this webcast to provide these services. So growing very fast. Less and less partners are buying their own internal licenses. And oftentimes, the ones that do are actually having a service provider provide the service on their behalf. That's very common, too. 45% uh, of IT spend on cloud by 2020. 
So, uh, you know, every partner is looking at cloud, at least having a discussion. Um, a lot of money is being spent on that migration, so uh, you are in a good spot. Definitely a good, good time to be in this business. Almost 5% of the server install base expected to migrate to hosted infrastructure over the next five years. Um, I would think it's maybe even higher than that these days. But uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of different companies are making this move. And then 38% of total SMB, small and medium-sized business, server spend on cloud providers in 2017. So that's a prediction. Um, I think that that will also come true. So, you know, at the end of the day, what we're saying is um, everything is moving towards the cloud. Most companies are at least having that conversation, and it's a great time to be in the business, especially if you can get in front of those partners and explain what you can do to help them with their, their business needs. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the service provider license agreement, like I said before, this enables you to provide hosted services to your customers. Um, and the way it works is that the distributor recruits new SPLA hosting partners. The distributor in this case would be Tech Data, so they've uh, recruited probably everyone on this call to be in SPLA. Um, and then that hosting provider, that would be you after you sign up for the program, uh, you are the licensee and you bill your customers based on their uh, use of the product. So I want to be really clear, um, as you report your usage under SPLA uh, every month, the reporting is based on customers' access to use, regardless of whether they access it or not. So um, just remember that it's like kind of like cable TV. If I go on vacation for a month, I, when I come home, I still have to pay that cable bill. SPLA is the same way. If you're, say, a hosting exchange for your partners, and one of your end customers goes on maternity leave for six months, but technically they still have access to the product and are enabled, they would need to be reported. So just keep that in mind. Everybody that has access is, is reported and, and paid for. And that's important to remember when you're talking to your customers so they have that expectation too. They should know that if uh, someone has access and doesn't use it, they still need to pay for that. That may change their you know, behavior. They may want to uh, you know, let you know when somebody's gone or no longer with the company, but it's good for them to know where they stand and what they have to license. And finally, the end customer consumes the service from the hoster. So kind of obvious there. Um, but yeah, your end customers are always the ones that are, are consuming that service and they're the ones that you're, you're paying for. Next slide, please. So when we look at the different licensing programs, um, you see the SPLA on the left. I think we've talked about that. Some, uh, one thing to remember about SPLA is that you can also have some internal use there. So most of your usage has to be external, but up to 50% of that total could be uh, internal use. So uh, you can utilize that, pro that, uh, that program as well. Um, some of the really common scenarios for SPLA are website hosting. So that would be a company that comes to you and has, you know, you host their website on their behalf. You are then providing them a service, and that would be SPLA. Application hosting, you know, you might be hosting applications for ISVs or like QuickBooks or some third-party apps. Um, any type of application hosting is SPLA. And messaging service would be another example. Hosted email, uh, hosted Skype, uh, hosted SharePoint, all kinds of the obvious Microsoft application products uh, would also fit under that. Looking at the other two, um, enterprise agreement, which is select, open, and open value. Um, with those, those are all internal use licenses. They're bought, they own it for a period of time, and they actually own those licenses. Unlike SPLA, under SPLA, you're really just renting the license every month. So one of the benefits here is that under Enterprise, Open, Select, any of those programs, you're making an upfront spend. That might make more sense when you're buying internal use licenses because you do know how many employees you have and a, you have a good idea how long they're going to be there. But when you're hosting, you uh, you don't know how many you know what the future might hold. So one of the best things about SPLA is that flexibility to report based on use and access to use. There's no upfront spend. Um, all the software in SPLA you can download and uh, again start reporting when you have paying customers or customers that are consuming the service at least. So make it really clear that's one of the best benefits of SPLA. Under Enterprise and the other programs, a big upfront spend and commitment there. And finally, online services. So online services would be Office 365, um, another one would be Azure. Those are services that are hosted by Microsoft. So 
should be pretty clear those those three examples. The next slide, please. So there is sometimes confusion around when SPLA is required. Um, this slide is, is an oldie but a goodie. Um, if you look at the left and compare that to the far right, I think that's where the most questions come in. Uh, SPLA, again, like I keep saying, is about software as a service. So it's hard to read. This is a slide that you probably will just keep for your own reference at a later time. Um, but there's some examples below as you look at this slide. And for example, you see in uh, case one, company A uses Microsoft SQL database software and Windows to store and display its customer's website content. So the fact that it's the customer's website content, that's what makes it hosting. Someone's providing a service for that customer hosting their website. Another example would be a company delivering a line of business application running on Windows and SQL. So again, they're delivering this on behalf of a third party, that would be SPLA. Um, in the middle you have volume licensing, which is gonna be internal use. You have license mobility, which I'll actually touch on at another point in this presentation. But I do wanna call it external connector licenses. So with my example from Barnes & Noble a moment ago, uh, this, this is kind of stating the same thing. External connectors allow an online store to allow its customers to purchase merchandise from them on that website. That would be an external connector. Or maybe somebody collaborating on a business project with an end customer. So I want to draw the line between the two and say that those on the left, the ones for SPLA, the end customer gets the benefit. The ones on the right, well, it's questionable. Both sides benefit, but really the online store is the benefit of their website, their, their business is to sell. And in the case two that you see there, that's collaboration. So both sides are working together. That's not software services. Software services resemble the SPLA part on the far left. So hang on to this eye chart. It'll be uh, helpful as you, uh, as you come into questions around when SPLA is required and when it's not. If you ever have any confusion or have an end customer that doesn't understand the product use rights, or actually it's been changed to the product terms now, uh, just last month, state no commercial hosting. So it does state that all those internal use licenses may not be used for hosting. And really clear statement there. So that was the product use slide. I don't know if we've advanced that slide, but uh, that's the one. So moving on to uh, the slide that says the offering SPA benefits. I will go over some of the benefits that are, uh, that are available in SPA. So the first one, um, customer choice. Um, hybrid, develop, hybrid deployments are very common and becoming the standard. When we say hybrid, what we're talking about is perhaps some, um, for a host or some of that's on their premise, some of that's on say Azure or even Amazon, AWS. Um, that would be the hybrid. Most partners are not moving everything to the public cloud at once. Usually it's a, it's a process. So. A lot of times a hoster will have some things again on premise and then start start moving things to the cloud. Same thing with your end customers moving to you as a hoster. So it doesn't always have to be everything, um, but it may, may take some time to get everything moved over or at least whatever makes sense to move to a hoster. Another benefit is end user evaluations. So this is for a trial period for your end users. Um, they're for prospective end users, so somebody that has not signed up with you as a customer yet. And it's a trial period for up to 60 days so they can evaluate the software service. Now during that term, you could not um, take money, so this is something that you'd be offering a, an eval. It's not a paid, uh, a paid time frame here for your end customer. And all, the, all this is stated in the SPA agreement itself. So you can see that language there if you want to review it. But again, uh, there is an end user evaluation for 60 days there. Um, another benefit is reliability. So in, enterprise class infrastructure as subscription delivered by professionals. So really this is just getting at the fact that you guys are the experts at delivering these services as opposed to an end customer trying to do it on their own if technology isn't really their primary business. Um, big benefit for them and make sure that they understand the value you're providing them and, and the service that you're giving. Another benefit, this is all scalable as your business grows. So as you, uh, as you roll out your hosted offering, you may only have one customer next month. A year from now, you may have 100. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to have to buy those licenses up front not knowing. So with SPA, it is scalable. You can, buy business, you can buy licenses as you grow. 
If you need to light up a new SQL server, a new Windows processor, that's fine. You just add that to your monthly report every month. So there's no upfront commitment. And uh, one of the, you know that's one of the best things in Splog. It goes right along with the next thing where it says no startup costs. Um, all media is downloadable in SPLA. You're never paying a dime for any of that. You're just paying when your customers start using it. So uh, a huge advantage there, I think, from uh, you know, the concept of trying to buy things up front. Um, it doesn't cost anything to join SPLA. You can cancel your SPLA agreement any time. Um, after your first six months, there is a $100 minimum that's in place. But beyond that, there's no requirements. So, um, if you if you meet that hundred dollar minimum and, and report every month, your agreement will stay active, and uh, you'll you'll stay in the SPA program. And finally, uh, SPA gives you the ability to protect your existing in investment. So this is the ability to transfer on-premise volume licenses to a, to a host environment. Really, this benefit is for your end customers, um, and it's referring to license mobility, which is the concept of your end customers bringing you their licenses that they purchased to put into your host environment. And we have a slide on that in a moment, and I'll get into that more deeply. But just know that you do uh, have the ability to utilize in-customer purchased licenses. Next slide, please. So um, again, no upfront cost. We like to make sure you know that, so it's here a couple times. Um, you have access to the most current product versions. So when a new version of, uh, say, SQL comes out, you can go right to uh, the, the Volume Licensing Center and download that. So you know, no need to go out and make any purchases. So uh, there was a time when you ordered disks in SPLA and, and had it all shipped. Big improvement now, everything online for download. Um, another benefit is the ability to test and evaluate Microsoft products up to 90 days. So that 90 days starts taking the day you download that media. So let's say that SQL, let's say a SQL version 2016 comes out. From the time you download that product, you'll have 90 days to test it internally. Um, during that testing period, likely you're building your offering, making sure it works in your architecture, and so forth. Now, after that 90 days, you'd have a choice. You could either start licensing your, use, you know, your internal users of that product, again, assuming that you have more external use than internal, or you could sign up for an MSDN agreement, which is basically a dev license, so dev and test. So there are... There is a subscription program available for you to sign up to do dev and test, but there is something built into SPLA for 90 days. Um, but again, limited from the time that you download that product. It's not perpetual. Another benefit, uh, you can also locate your servers at end customer locations and even on their hardware. So if you do that, you need to maintain control of that environment. You, uh, you are the one that could turn it off and turn it on. You manage that server. You could never put that server in a customer facility and just let them, you know, manage that on, on their own. You know, one reason is they could sever a relationship with you and basically take all of our media, all of our uh, product with them. So if you locate your server there, you control it. This comes up a lot with, uh, with healthcare because sometimes people don't want that healthcare information outside their four walls. It can also come up a lot if you do business in Asia where they uh, – often won't have those servers outside the country, or they may even want it inside the business. So there are some times, again, where people will request that server in their environment, and we can accommodate that too. And finally, you can sell services to end customers anywhere in the world. So under your SPLA agreement that you have, let's say, you know, you have it with tech data, it's a U.S.-based agreement, it's going to be billed in U.S. dollars, uh, you would report any end customers that are outside the U.S., with a usage, um, basically usage indicator of where they are on your monthly report. So if you have customers, say, in England, you would report that as England use on your, on your reporting. And Tech Data can help you with any questions on how to designate that. But again, it's where your end customers set. The billing will come to you all in U.S. currency on one bill, so it won't be split out into uh, yen or pounds or anything crazy. Um, you will all be built in the U.S. currency. If uh, one note, if anybody wanted to be building another currency, you'd have to sign up for a SPA agreement in that country. It's all aware about where the uh, SPA agreement's signed. But your end customers can sit anywhere. Next slide, please. So here are some of the common scenarios for uh, hosters. 
um, one of which is VM hosting, which is really big now with uh, Amazon and Azure both getting into the game. This is where you're renting virtual servers. Um, they're typically going to be shared, and uh, you know, you're just running everything on VMs. And with this, you're licensing Windows, System Center, probably SQL in there too, I imagine. Um, another one would be database hosting. So this is where you're, again, just hosting a database for the end users. Really straightforward, that one. Um, application hosting would be uh, Microsoft products like Link, now Skype, SharePoint, Exchange Dynamics, or it could be in customer owned apps. So they may have you hosted on their behalf, which again would put you into the software services business. Um, so there's some examples there, but uh, there's a lot of different apps that could come into play here. Web hosting is another one. So you're just hosting websites for someone else, always going to be under SPLA. And then finally, desktop hosting. So this is a tricky one. Uh, if you want to provide a desktop to your end customer, you can do that under SPA. Uh, however, it cannot be the Windows desktop OS. It can't be Windows 7, Windows 10, XP, anything like that. Under SPA, the way that you would do this is to use Windows Server to emulate a desktop experience. So again, you can use Windows Server to provide a desktop to your customer. Um, they would utilize remote desktop services to access that server. But with their experience would show a desktop that looks and feels just like the like Windows 10 experience I'm used to today. Um, there are a lot of offerings out there. Usually you can't tell the difference between the desktop product and the, uh, and the emulated experience using Windows Server. And I've seen some pretty senior people at Microsoft Windows Teams try to figure out which one is the real one um, and possible. So great hosting being done with desktop hosting. One of the fastest growing uh, areas of SPLA is around desktop hosting. And oftentimes in these situations, they're uh, hosting Office too. So um, again, they would be at, on their PCs going through a remote desktop session, getting a Windows experience and most likely Office. Next slide, please. So looking at the SPLA licensing models, there's really three different ones today. One of them is subscriber access license. So this is kind of similar to a cow they're used to in volume licensing. One license covers one unique individual for one month. Um, this, would allow, this would be, again, for anybody that's authorized to access the software. Not every product's available under SAL. Um, the ones that make sense are, though. So Windows and SQL, uh, not so, Windows doesn't have SALs. SQL has a C standard SAL. But most of the other products that we see under SAL are you know, user-based products like Exchange, Link, SharePoint. Products like that. Um, the benefits include uh, these users could access any number of servers. So, say you uh, are using a SharePoint, or pardon me, a SQL standard SAL, that user with that SAL would be covered for any SQL use in your whole environment. So, they're kind of like a library card. Um, same with Exchange. Maybe you have Exchange built across 10 different servers. Each user would only need one SAL to use Exchange. Um, if you're licensing products by subscriber access licenses, you do not need to license by processor license. It's one or the other. In volume licensing, it's oftentimes both. But in SPLA, you pick one. Um, subscriber access licenses allow you to scale out. So you can have a lot of servers in the mix, and you're only paying, again, for those users that are using it. And there's minimal startup costs. So it doesn't cost a lot just to report everything by user, um, especially like SQL, for example. Looking at processor licenses in comparison, um, a PROC license covers one processor for an unlimited number of users. So, you know, two PROCs, two processors on one box would be two licenses. Any number of users could access that. You're not counting the users at that point. Um, so the benefits, I mean, it's much easier to count your, your servers than probably all the users you have. Um, it's economical. There used to be more products in SPLA that had a choice between a user license or a processor license. Now it's pretty much the ones that make sense, like Windows and SQL, almost always go processor license. So we say it's economical. Really, around the common products, you don't have as much a choice these days. But uh, it's certainly uh, it, it's a movement to, to to the better. I think you're licensing, uh, you know, licensing Windows by user doesn't make sense. So a processor license is a nice way and an inexpensive way to have unlimited users. And then finally, core licenses. So core licenses are similar to uh, processor licenses. 
except for you're counting cores instead of procs. Um, SQL is the most popular one under core license. His talk is the other one. Those are the only two products in SPLA that have core licenses. So again, if you uh, SQL, you're counting all the cores and that's what you're reporting. They come in two core packs, as you'll see in the, uh, the product terms and in the, in the uh, price list. Moving on to the next slide, please. So now, talking about license mobility through software assurance. So license mobility is the concept of an end customer bringing you their license, their internal use license, for you to deploy in your environment or in your cloud. Um, one thing that you need to remember for sure is that it has to have software assurance to be eligible. So that end customer would have needed to purchase software assurance to even start this conversation. So assuming that they do have software assurance, um, you'd also want to verify in the product terms that uh, they have that is eligible for software assurance. Not every product has software or has license mobility um, enabled for it. So, for example, uh, Windows does not have license mobility through software assurance. Neither does Office. Those are the two most common that come up that do not have license mobility through software assurance. Now, SQL, um, Exchange, SharePoint, they all do. So, um, certainly, certainly are eligible. To know that again, look in the uh, in the product terms, the VL product terms, and it will indicate that. It will say um, license mobility through server farms is how it's termed. If that's a yes, then it has uh, license mobility to SPLA as well. So there's some good documents out there that Tech Data could provide you that go deeply into software or license mobility. Um, so take a look at those if you're really going down that path. Uh, a couple other things I'll mention though. You, uh, as, a, as a hoster, you would need an amendment to be a licensed mobility provider. Easy to get that amendment. You just um, sign the document and you're established. But your end customers, when they brought you those, those licenses, would go through a verification process with Microsoft to make sure they had the right licenses and they had software assurance. So there, there is a process that goes with it. It's not too painful, um, but you do have to make sure to follow the right steps. So again, we have some very, uh, extensive guides that go into all that, and if you have uh, have questions, I'd recommend those first. Um, but yeah, if you're in customers, request to bring their licenses, just know that that's a possibility. Please. So as one of the terms of the SPA agreement, you must create an in-customer enrollment for any in-customer that goes over $1,000 a month in SPA. So you may have, say, 10 customers of your service, one of which is larger, and they're $1,000 a month. That customer would have an in-customer enrollment set up and it would be reported separately under SPLA every month. Um, this form that you see in front of you can be obtained through Tech Data, and uh, it's, it's simple to set it up, but just know that it'll be an extra step when you go to report the licensing every month. Okay, so looking at Windows Azure for hosters. Um, as a hoster, you can certainly use Azure to host your products. You could use, you know, I know a lot of people use Amazon too. We'd like to see them all move to Azure, that's for sure. But the use rights would be the same. So you can deploy um, products there. But the way you do it is uh, any processor or core-based product would be consumed through the data center provider, in this case, Azure. Any user-based products would be reported under your SPLA agreement. So as the example shows you, you see Windows um, up top. That's all provided by Azure. Um, but then the SAL licenses for, uh, say, Remote Desktop, Link, SharePoint, and Office, that would be reported under SPLA. It's not possible, though, to report, say, SQL under your SPLA and deploy that on Azure or Amazon um, cause, because it's a core-based product. I guess with the exception of the, if you want to report it by, by user, by SAL, which is rare. Um, same with Windows. Windows, if you're buying Windows, you're going to buy that directly from Azure. So uh, I think more and more people are moving this direction. The days of buying your own data center probably are, are days of the past. Um, it's more economical, usually, to, uh, to utilize somebody like Azure we already have the environment set up with disaster recovery, everything built in, and deploying from there. Uh, but I think a lot of these end customers certainly need service providers to manage these environments and to provide these services for them. So 
but it's still a very good play for all of our partners. Go to the next slide. In order to become a hosting partner, um, basically you would uh, contact Tech Data, of course, sign up for SPLA. But in so doing, you know, in doing that, you also need to join the partner network. Um, you join the hosting community. Um, you'd sign the MBSA, which uh, you may already have one of those through another volume licensing program. It's just part of the uh, SPLA agreement packet. And then you start building out your environment. So once you're in the program, you can download that media, get everything set up, and then start reporting. So we do understand that there is a time frame that uh, it takes some time to get customers to come to your offering and start transacting. So if that does take time and you are truly just building your environment from scratch, there is a six-month period where you do not report usage. So if you don't have paying customers, um, then you don't have to report yet. You can do zero use, like I said. After that six months, then you will have a month to report, and it must be over $100 a month. So prior to that, by the way, prior to that six-month period, you could report under $100. So you know, as of that six months, that's when it goes to 100 every month at least. Next slide, please. So yeah, this just kind of reinforces what I said. Um, talks about signing the SPLA agreement, developing your solution, and reporting that usage every month. So make sure you can get into that rhythm of reporting every month to, re to, uh, to Tech Data. The, I believe the reports are due by the 10th every month. Um, sometimes you could miss a report, maybe some days on vacation. Just be sure to have somebody taking care of that responsibility. If an agreement goes a certain period of time, I think it's 90 days without a usage report, it will get terminated. So that, that you can always sign a new agreement, but that's uh, probably work that you don't want or need. So just be sure to have that monthly report covered every month. And with that, I think we can uh, open it up to any questions. Okay. All right. So um, thank you, Lance, um, for going through that presentation. Um, on this last page, we have our contact information. Um, so why Tech Data? Um, we do have a lot to offer here. We have our automated reoccurring billing for unchanged reporting months, consolidated billing for one time. Um, you get one bill from Tech Data each month. We also have our self-service invoice history dashboard in our solution store portal and a dedicated SPLA team here. So any questions that you may have about your SPLA agreement or um, any processes, you can just feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can, if you would like to schedule a call or have any questions, please um, refer them to our SPLA inbox. It's SPLA at techdata.com. Either myself or my colleague David Fletcher would be more than happy to assist. Um, we also have our phone number listed um, on this page with our extension. So um, now we'll just go over a couple of questions. Uh, if anyone else on the line has any questions that they would like to ask, just feel free to um, submit them right now. So our first question that we have here is um, an attendee asking for a more, a better explanation of commercial use. So, Lance? So, commercial, I would define commercial use as the reason they are transacting with you is to use your software. So, as opposed to, say, e-commerce or anything else, you are selling a software service. That's why they're there. Um, in my example, like Barnes & Noble, when I use the website there, I go to Barnes & Noble to buy a book. It has nothing to do with using that software. As opposed to, say, my example of TurboTax, when I go and use TurboTax, it's commercial software because the only reason I'm there is to use the software. TurboTax doesn't get a dime of my tax money. That goes to the government. The only service that TurboTax provides is the software, and that is commercially hosted software in that case. Um, we have another attendee um, asking if this presentation is going to be recorded. Um, this presentation will be recording. It should be ready um, and posted on our Tech Data website by um, tomorrow. And um, we will be sending out links to all the attendees to access that um, presentation. So it will be available for you. Um, another question is, can you explain a little bit more about desktop hosting? Sure. I, I'm, I'm trying to what else we could cover. 
The main thing, again, with desktop hosting is there's a prohibition for hosting the actual Windows desktop OS. So I, I know that technically you all could stand this up. I know you could. You could, uh, on your server, you could set up a Windows 7 instance. You could allow your end customers to access that. It would all work. Problem is, is that it's prohibited at Microsoft. So the only way to provide a hosted desktop is using Windows Server to emulate that. Now we do have some good documents that can explain that and um, speak to it. So if you want, if you have more questions on it, just email Tech Data, and I can make sure they have the right information. Um, but that's the only way to do it. Now there is one other way um, to provide Windows, and it, it, that's if any of anybody out there is renting physical computers to end customers. So if you actually rent physical machines to your end customer, laptops or desktops, um, there is a way to, uh, to get a rental PC amendment through Microsoft under your SPA agreement. Uh, under that, you would need to have OEM software, it'd have to be Vista or better, installed on there. And then you could, uh, you could install, say, Windows 10 and rent that out monthly. So keep in mind, if you're going to rent that physical PC, you're paying for that OEM up front, and then you're going to pay for that Windows license every month that your end customer uses. But we do we do have that uh, ability. So you see this with, you know, maybe companies just want to rent a desktop because they don't want to make that spend. The other time you see it is when you go to trade shows. All those kiosks that you see where you can go up and uh, check your email and do things, most of those companies are in the SPA agreement, also under desktop rental. So I know the question originally that you asked was around desktop hosting, and again, that has to be done through Windows Server. But yeah, you can uh, rent physical machines if you like, and just uh, ask Tech Data for an amendment if that's a path you want to pursue. Okay. Um, our next question is: Can SPLA be used for hardware as a service? Let me think. The thought behind the question: um, Hardware as a service. I'm not sure if I understand where that question is coming from, but what I Usually, most hosters are going to use their own hardware, uh, and you know, it's really the software the customers are wanting to access. But you could think of it as hardware, I guess, if uh, your customers just don't want to buy the hardware themselves. Um, so I, I, I guess I've never had the question on hardware as a service. But you, like I said before, you can use an end customer's hardware as long as you maintain the uh, control of the environment. But uh, other than that, I can't think of a case for hardware as a service necessarily. There is a ISV royalty, another separate program, enables you to embed products in hardware that you put at a customer premise, and, and oftentimes you can own that hardware event or software and hardware and turn that over to your end customer eventually over time. There's nothing like that in SPLA. Under SPLA, it's always going to be a rental model. There's no, no turning over of anything, hardware or software. So I probably didn't catch that question exactly, but if you want to elaborate and send an email to Tech Data, we can certainly delve further into it. Okay. Um, is there a reasoning why Microsoft prohibits running a Windows 7 environment? That is just Microsoft's business strategy and the um, rules that come from the Windows team, so I don't, I don't have the why, but uh, it's certainly the, the reality. Okay. Um, are the pricing um, tier, are, the, are there pricing tiers for SPLA? Good question on pricing. So all pricing set by your reseller. Um, having said that, for Microsoft, the price is the same across the board. It, our biggest hoster gets the same prices as our smallest hoster. There's no, uh, there's no tiers at all. Um, having, you know, speaking of price, one thing I should call out is around price changes. So Microsoft can lower the price at any time during the year, but we can only raise it in January. So um, price increases for existing products can only go up, go up in January. Um, if a new product came out, there could be a new price for that product, like you know, like another SQL version or something. But we won't change the prices on existing products except for once a year. And you know, I do men again mention that we can lower them any time. We have done that many times in the past. So. Uh, for example, Windows licenses used to be about $150 a processor. Now they're more like 15 or 20. So we have lower prices on some products, and those can come anytime. Okay. And um, we got a little bit of a clarification on the hardware for service. So basically, it's um, rental where 
they can retain um, ownership of the hardware. So the hoster, the yes, and the hoster, the hoster would. Yeah, well, the hoster should always maintain ownership of the hardware. There's mm -hmm. never any selling of hardware in SWA, that's for sure. Okay. So, right. you know, the only hardware, the only hardware as a service I can think of along those lines are what I spoke about before around renting desktops to end customers. You can do that, certainly. Okay. With an amendment. Yep. Um, is there any reporting from Tech Data or Microsoft to help with our account and reporting? or are we completely responsible for tracking the licenses used? You are responsible so, for tracking licenses mm -hmm. used. Go ahead, go ahead, Kanisha. Yeah, so um, Tech Data, we are working on a, a licensing tracking tool that we will be offering to our customers. Um, this will probably roll out sometime next year, but for now, you are responsible for um, tracking your own use. Did you have anything else to add on to that, Lance? Oh, um, not really. Yeah, Microsoft's also looking at similar technologies. I don't have a, a time frame necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. I would also say that System Center products can give you a good way to count some of your internal, some of the use um, VMs and such. But I do know it's a pain point uh, counting licenses accurately. Mm -hmm. A known issue for sure. Um, what are the requirements for becoming a Microsoft partner? So to register, to be a registered partner, not really any yeah. requirements. It's take you about two minutes mm -hmm. to sign up for that. Yep. Okay. Uh, I think you just ask the name, address, uh, email address, probably pretty simple to sign up. But then, that, you know, over at, once you're in the program, you can move up, you know, all the way up to being a gold partner, and then there's requirements there. If you want to learn about how to move through those levels in the partner program, just go to Microsoft.com slash partner, and it'll lay out the requirements. So we only require the most basic level to join SPLA, but there are benefits that come with being gold and silver, so certainly look into that. Okay. Um, I think it looks like that's going to be it on the questions. Um, We'll just wait a second to see if anyone else has any other questions they want to submit. All right, it looks like that's it. Um, thank you everyone for um, joining this webinar today. We will be sending out links to the webinar to all the attendees and you know whoever weren't able to make it will be um, sending out links and a copy of these slides. Um, if you have any questions, um, please reach out to us at SPLA at techdata.com or just give us a call, and um, that will conclude the webinar today. Thank you.